Greetings, and welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Dr. Steve Gallon III. I'm very excited today to be here with a very special guest who represents uh, the struggle, the success, and, and really overcoming adversity, starting as a product of the Miami Gardens community, navigating through the educational landscape, and really finding her place and her passion and her purpose with respect to entrepreneurship and business. Uh, her journey really indicates something that is critically important to our students as they matriculate through Miami-Dade County Public Schools, but most importantly, as we start to transition into the commencement season for our students who are getting ready to graduate from high school and transition into the real world of work and post-secondary experiences. Uh, my guest is none other than Claudianne Hibbert Smith, a graduate of Miami Carroll City Senior High School, a graduate of the University of Florida, and I would like to say a successful graduate of the School of Hard Knocks, an entrepreneur, a mother, a community advocate, and a champion for our children. Welcome to Real Talk. Well, thanks for having me, and what an amazing intro. Yes. I've got to use that. Yes. Um, glad to have you on the set. We've, we've had an opportunity over the past week to really start to engage our students in, in our schools with respect to this discussion on financial literacy. But before I get there, why, why is this important? I believe that it's important because as we start to engage in the national uh, discourse around what's happening on Wall Street, okay. very often we forget what happens on Main Street. And I believe that Main Street starts in our communities, in our families, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, and again, in our schools with our children. Uh, but before I dive into that, tell us about Claudia and Hibbert Smith. I gave you an introduction, but, but tell my viewers uh, your background, your uh, life experiences, and what you're currently doing in the professional space of business and entrepreneurship. You know, I always like to start right around when I was the age of 14, and I gave birth to my son in the ninth grade, um, walking through the halls of Miami Carroll City Senior High and a summer program at the time. I was not a student there yet. And I remember just not missing a day of school. I remember people saying, you know, by the time I got to the 11th grade, I'd have four or five kids probably end up in jail. And the truth is, if I would have continued on that path, that those things could have been possible. Um, but I, I'd like to say that I got around the right people, the right group of friends, and I graduated from Miami Carroll City at the top of my class as my class VP. Um, went on to the University of Florida, graduated once again at the top of my class, and I got a job. Um, and I remember going to work every day, single mom, you know, struggling. You know, and then I moved over to another area of business, which is real estate. I became a real estate agent, and the rest is history. I became an agent and an investor all at the same time. What did you major in at the University of Florida. So it's funny that you asked me that. I majored in health professions. Yeah, a lot of people just talk about I graduated. What, what did you major in? Health professions, and so we had rehab, occupational, and physical therapy in our school. Okay. Uh, I won't hold it against you that you graduated from Carroll City Senior <laughs> High School. I'm a graduate of Miami Northwestern Senior High School. I won't hold it against you that you graduated from the University of Florida. Uh, I graduated from the highest of seven hills, Florida A&M University, although we are still trying to reconcile issues with the $237 million check or whatever donation was made. Uh, that's another conversation for another time. Right. But, but you and I share, we share graduating from the School of Hard Knocks, making not the best decisions as young people, right. myself being a teenage father at the age of 16, but utilizing uh, that setback a as a come up, having a sense of motivation that we had to find passion and purpose in a pathway that was beyond our individual selves. Mm -hmm. For me, I made no apologies that uh, becoming a teenage parent was the catalyst for my life uh, turnaround. Uh, absolutely. I grew up in a single uh, parent household when my parents divorced. I'm the youngest of six. My brothers went to prison. I went to college. And again, it was the catalyst knowing that education was going to be the pathway for me to find uh, my voice and again, a platform for, for my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I was an educational purist. I went to college to major in education. Uh, but again, we plan, but God laughs. So right. you had a plan to go into that particular profession 
but God had another plan for your life, and that plan has really been tremendously uh, powerful, not only to you as an individual, but what I've been able to see, it's been powerfully impactful to the students at Carroll City, to the, to the residents and community members of Miami Gardens, and again, I'm sure to your family and, and those who, who you support and care about and love. So we, we share that graduation status yeah. and everything else I, I won't hold against you. Uh, let, let's talk about <laughs> how you transitioned uh, out, out of that pathway toward what you studied to what you eventually got into. Talk, talk, to, talk to me about that because our young people are going to have to figure things out. They have right. a plan, which we want all of our students to have a plan, full stop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We want them to have a plan for their lives, but they have to be willing to pivot and be able to tap into their passion and their purpose. And that is something that you seem to have done very well and found profit mm -hmm. in it as well. Talk, talk so to us I, about that. I want to move back for a second because mm -hmm. I am the last child of four. Uh, my sister above me and I are nine years apart, so you realize um, I was the last of the Mohicans, I would call it. And I was also kind of sort of the black sheep of my family. Uh, my siblings had not had any track record of getting in trouble. Uh, we grew up in Carroll City. They were m and uh, they had m and transferred to North Miami Beach. And as life went, everybody was fine until Claudianne was <laughs> birthed. And, you know, I'd say this to say, well, I'll start here. I always knew that I would be successful, even in the triumphs of times because I wasn't making the right decisions. I was always a leader, just leading the people in the wrong direction. So I knew, and I'll say this, I had a teacher in the seventh grade. Uh, her name was Tina Howell, and she took me in, and that's when my life changed. That was when I started to learn about finances. That was when I started to learn about life, like the life beyond what I could even imagine it to be. And I remember going to college and reading a book that talked a little bit about real estate. It was Rich Dad, Poor Dad at the time. And when I graduated and got into the workspace, I again knew that I would be successful. I, I almost knew that it was just only a short bit of time that I would be there. I was not making, ex I was still, I was still broke. So you had a job. I had a job. See, as long as we've known you, I never, I, I never envisioned you as having a job. You showed up to somebody's job. Every day. Okay, you had a job. Never was late. Okay, you had a job. Stayed late. Okay. Was the number one on the charts. So I knew I would be successful. I was successful in that job. Okay. But I knew it wasn't going to be the end for me. I just didn't know what it was going to be that was going to take me to the next level. Well, that same mentor ended up moving back to Florida and buying a house. And so now I'm exposed to a real estate transaction. And I looked at the pay, they called it the HUD statement back then, now it's called the closing disclosure. And I remembered her making $40,000 in about two months. From the time we saw that house to closing was two months. And I said, well, Claudia, you know how to add and subtract and something's not adding up here. Because it took me a whole year to make $40,000. Two days later, I quit my job, and I don't promote this, and I don't recommend this. I had no job etiquette to, you know, give two weeks notice. I didn't know those things. And so I just took off. I didn't even know how to get my real estate license, but I knew I knew how to learn. I knew how to uh, be focused, committed. I knew those things. I mean, it just took me a week to get my real estate license, and that's where it transitioned for me. Um, I got my license. I became the rookie of the year of my company. We had about 3,500 agents at the time, and the rest was history. I remember making my first paycheck, uh, maybe not my first, but maybe my third paycheck, and starting to invest. And so literally the time that I became a realtor is the same time I began to invest in real estate. And although I didn't have a plan, I didn't know really how, I knew that at some point in my life, I wasn't going to be working, you know, whether it be for commissions in real estate or at someone's job or whatever the case may be, I wanted to create some passive income. And so right around the age of 21, 22, things started to change financially for me. Well, well, the catalyst for all of the things that you discussed was something that is critically important to all young people all communities, all families, all zip codes. Regretfully, in today's society, 
that thing that is critically important, everyone doesn't have access to it. Mm -hmm. And that comes to, down to one word, exposure. You are exposed to something. So if I were amongst a congregation on a Sunday morning, I would say, say exposure. Then I would say, say it again. And the church would say, exposure. Right. Say it one more time. Exposure. exposure that's right. So you were exposed to what was on that sheet that very often people don't have exposure to the options that life, that, that a career, that uh, the promise of, of, that's reflected in the United States uh, reflects. And, and that is the uh, promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, in certain segments of our communities, it is about graduating from high school, potentially going to college, and getting a good job, mm -hmm. full stop. But in other sectors of society, that's not the end all and be all. It's Correct. about ownership. It's about uh, financial independence. It's about entrepreneurship. It's about investments. It's about realizing the American dream. And one of the most uh, simple, mundane expectations of what reflects the American dream is this issue of home ownership. Mm -hmm. So I want to pivot to, yes, we can talk locally, we can talk statewide, but as we look at what's happening around uh, the national landscape, this whole issue of what's not happening on Main Street is reflected in the inability for people to own homes. And we're going to get into that, but we talked about this last week that the predicate to home ownership is financial literacy. Correct. So how do you view your educational experiences coming out of school uh, in terms of preparing you for some of the successes that you've had, number one, and how do you reconcile your experiences to what you see with people every day trying to fulfill the promise of the American dream through home ownership? Because all of those things go together. And so the first question is, I don't know that when I was in college, I really learned about finances. I don't know that I learned about budgeting. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't. I had a mentor that had been really wealthy at this, at this juncture now, um, and through me spending time during the summers, you know, I knew that I wasn't going to um, play too much around with money during college. That's what I learned, but I learned it really through her. Um, I, I don't know that college is a segue for everyone, but what I do love about my college experience is the exposure to different cultures. Um, I went to Miami Carroll City. It was a predominantly black, you know, high school. Let's talk about that. So everybody's not going to college. Okay. We know that. It is our expectation, a reasonable expectation, that most of our students will graduate from high school. Okay. When you look at your experience, and I can look at mine as well, uh, in high school, do you believe that it prepared you for some of the fundamentals that we are talking about with our young people today in terms of financial literacy? If I could be totally transparent. I expect you to be. You know, I called a good friend of mine, Dr. Nia Canty, who went over to FSU, and I called her and I was like, yo, why are we having to take remedial classes at, at the University of Florida when we first entered? And she said, Claudia, we graduated at the top of the bottom, the top of the bottom. So we were not educated at the level of our other, I don't even I know if I would call them counterparts, but other races across the board. But eventually we, we did what we needed to do. We graduated and graduated at the top of that class as well. Um, so the answer is, I don't believe I was fully prepared to enter in, into the University of Florida. And it could be partially my responsibility, but it could have also been the responsibility of my school. And that's me being transparent. But, 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 that, but that's a metric that's somewhat restricted to academics as defined at that particular time by the University of Florida. Correct. I'm looking at the metric that is universal in terms of what's defined and what's necessary and what's requisite, not for the University of Florida, not for FAMU, but okay. for life. And my experience was a little bit different because I will honestly say I graduated in three years uh, from Florida a University and I earned a master's and doctorate from FIU. And I can tell you my intellectual ice was freezing. Meaning when I got wow. to FIU for my master's and my doctorate, uh, I was truly prepared. 
truly prepared, although I had to overcome some barriers to get there because there were some systemic notions and predispositions about me coming from an HBCU. Coming mm -hmm. from an HBCU already brought with it some predispositions, but I was able to quickly debunk and those. And that could be some of the differences as well. Yeah, I was able to quickly debunk those because of the confidence and the preparation and the self-confidence that, that I got from Northwestern and from an HBCU such as FAMU. But, but going back to the point of the, the requisite skills and understanding and, again, exposure to those things around financial literacy, did you get those in high school? I did not. Okay, neither did I. I did not. So now when you look at your role, your, your, your business, and your interaction with people, I can ask, when did you graduate from high school? How many years ago? You can say it. You don't want to say it. Class Ten, of 97. Five, five years ago then? Oh, 20 years ago. Okay. I'll take it. Okay. Decades ago. Okay. Do you find that the people that you interact with right now are more prepared or as Tupac would say, you see no changes. In terms of financial literacy and preparing for home ownership, which is the staple of the American dream. I'm so, looking for that change, if any. It depends on what, who I'm speaking to. So you've got this very small population of people who are prepared, and it's very minute. So that I will say. And then you have this population over here, I would not say that they are not prepared because they've not been educated uh, from a school perspective, or maybe they have, have not had any experiences, but they just were not taught. They just were not taught. But there's a huge population of people who are either not financially prepared, or they just do not know, or, you know, when, when you go into a bank, and I, I just want to be transparent, because of maybe you're a woman or you're an African American, you're, you're, what they are looking at is totally different than the counterpart over here that might have a whole bunch of opportunities um, that we just don't have. I, I was having a conversation with someone this morning about another issue relative to some of the disparities that exist in education, in politics, in business, we know the history of redlining that's reflected in this country. I say that to say we know what we know. Mm -hmm. So there's no surprise. But in anticipation for what we already know, there is some level of expectation to prepare. Do you find that people have made decisions early on that have not prepared them to be as successful in home ownership as they, they, they should be? I do, but so the answer to that question is yes. But I also know that environments are, well, your environment is going to really shape who you are. It's going to shape your knowledge and what, what information you might have. Now, let's, let's just look at us for a second. We know that there is a need for financial literacy. We can keep saying we know that there is a need for financial literacy, but we didn't do that. You made a phone call to me, Danny Felton, and you said, listen, we need to get into our schools and have a conversation with the students before they even go to the next, whether it's college, whether it's whatever they do, because they need to know. Do you find that some of the people you interact with trying to get a home did not have that conversation? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. That's where we are right now. Now, that there was a question that was asked after every session. It was, did you learn something uh, today that you didn't know before you got here? And the number of hands that went up, I mean, that speaks for itself. We had students that talked about they didn't even know what scores were. There was, they didn't even know an Experian Equifax existed. That was my story. Yeah. And what we're talking about, viewers, we're talking about the District 1 Financial Literacy Senior Symposium. Myself, Claudia and Hibbert Smith, and Danny Felton have come together to spend time having a conversation with our graduating seniors about uh, life choices and decisions that they're going to make in the next coming weeks, months, and years that will have an impact on their life from a financial standpoint. And conversations that I'm hearing that too often people in certain segments of the community, certain segments of society, don't have access to that conversation. Right. Don't have exposure to that kind of conversation that happens at, at kitchen tables. What, what are some of the common things that you find with the average adult, college graduate, looking to buy a home, 
I know the market is a whole nother show, mm -hmm. but we can talk about the fundamentals of what one can control. Okay. One can control his or her decision making, his or her credit score, his or her savings, his or her financial decision making. We can't control whether or not uh, the, the price of housing yeah. is, is, is off the roof. But, but what are some of the fundamentals that you find very often from a financial standpoint that uh, plague many of our young people looking to buy a home? They did all of the right things and they say, now I'm going to have the example, the uh, modicum of, of the American dream, which is a home. What are some of the things that you find? One of the biggest ones are school loans. Stu school, student school loans is a huge one for us. And this was not always the case. And so a few years ago, uh, there was a requirement now that was changed. Even if you had your loans in deferment, they were still going to calculate a percentage of whatever that payment may look like. And once they started to do that, it took that buyer. They could have had the best credit. They could have been making more six figures. They could have been making multiple six figures. But as you might know, I mean, many, 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 many college students have student school loans. And unfortunately, we didn't know that going in. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't, no one talked to us about what is the potential of home ownership looking like for you with this degree, with this income. And I wanna back up for a second. Um, you might go to the same job and be an African American, get way less pay than someone that does not look like you. So here you are, you're, you're in a great industry. They said, you know, when you graduate, you're going to be, you know, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to be making $150,000 a year. But then you're not making $150,000, but Rebecca is making one hundred and fifty, dollars and now you're making ninety dollars or one hundred. dollars And so there are all kinds of disparities across the board. And so now when you look at the, the financial makeup of this person, it's not a bad financial makeup. But when you have laws and regulations put in place, now your loan's gonna be in deferment. You're not expecting to make a loan payment in the next five years. But now, you know, the banking system is saying, no, we are going to calculate what this loan payment looks for you. It just sometimes, most times, take that buyer out of that population of buying. That's just one yeah, example. Yeah. And, and, I think, and I think the bank is, is making a prudent analysis to not project what your capacity is going to be over the course of five years and projecting what it's going to be over 15 or 30 years. So I don't fault the bank. What I do say is um, systemically you have certain communities, certain segments of the student population that's more likely to need a student loan to go to school. Now we more re recently had uh, President Biden to uh, forgive the loans. I don't know if that's going to be a dramatic shift in, in it has been. Okay, it has been. It has been. Okay. It ha it, that has been, whew, just think, you want to become a homeowner. You are making, I don't know, $130,000 a year in your industry, and your $350,000 school loan has just been forgiven. That has been example after example. A lot of our buyers are now in homes. Because of that. Because of that. So aside from student loans, what other kind of uh, decisions that you find young people made early on in their lives post-secondary that preclude them from having a solid, solid financial footing for home ownership? Well, I'll just use me as an example. Mm -hmm. um, having expenses that you really shouldn't have <laughs> coming out of college, whether it's that new car or, or the car that's doubled the price because you just wanted this desired car, that, that could be one of them. Um, just really increasing unnecessary, maybe I should say that, unnecessary expenses I mean, I just use me as an example, and it just because you don't know. You don't know that the bank or the credit bureaus are going to say, okay, wait, your capacity's too high. Your scores are now going to be dropped 100 points because what you've done is just maxed out all your credit cards. You've maxed out what you can buy for a car unnecessarily sometimes. And so along the way, I find that because we don't know, and it's a lot, and I have to keep saying this, we, we're ignorant, we don't know, we weren't taught. 
Even coming through college, we weren't taught. So now we're excited. Just think about it. You've graduated. You're the first to graduate in your family or whatever the case may be. You've gotten your job. You didn't, you, you didn't have a car in high school. You didn't have one in college. And now you have your car. Now you have credit cards where you can now go and shop and do the things that you've always wanted to do. Put your trips on there. And now you're maxed up in credit cards. You, you know, for so me, do you, do you, those so, were some of my experiences. So do you find that it's... Uh, obviously the credit score is related to how much a person is maxed out but it's also related to how much people simply don't pay they just stop paying well what do you find it's a combination of both uh, bad credit and the bad credit is a catalyst for people just not paying or maxing out or both not paying their bills on time not paying their bills I mean they're paying them but they're 30 60 90 days late you, you know, and then some of them fall into default forever. And these are decisions that young people incurred at a very young age. We see a lot of medical bills, too. Talk about a lot of medical bills, you know. And if they're not excessive, banks would actually, you know, not even contribute them towards your overall credit makeup. But they do affect your credit scores. And so we see a lot of medical bills. We see a lot of unpaid credit cards a lot of unpaid student loans um, in default. And I, I mean, that's what I see. Well, we're on a campaign. Just right being in, a, in the industry, that's what we see. Well, we're on a campaign right now to try to plant the seeds of knowledge, exposure of information under the umbrella of education to our young people uh, who are about to transition. And, and as you indicated, our symposium was off to a great start, uh, getting positive feedback from the students who now understand certain things and we we know that home ownership is the beginning of steps toward some level of independence but this whole conversation around generational wealth mm -hmm. um, how important is that in terms of what you've seen from your personal experiences I know you've talked about uh, your first purchase was a duplex and mm -hmm. I can talk about my first purchase that got me into a good place for for some of the financial independence that I have. But uh, talk to our viewers about that, because obviously we've talked about this with the students, but I think it's important for people to make that decision early on. Well, I think real estate is one of the ways, if not the one guaranteed way that you can create wealth. Um, yes, I'm a real estate agent, but I don't believe that you need to be a real estate agent obviously like yourself, to be in the space of real estate investing. Use a strong word to use guarantee. Somebody from 2008 would beg to differ. Well, to, oh, you think so that's let a, me just say this. <laughs> that let, 2008. Let me, let me say yeah. this. Let me say this. That was a crisis. That was a world crisis. And it wasn't just a crisis in real estate. It was a crisis across all industries in the United States of America. Um, and although... Do you the, think the housing market was unfairly blamed for it? Took the bulk of the blame. I know Wall Street got bailed out and everything I else. Believe, but I believe. I believe. I believe several factors. You know, they had stated stated loans, so that it was almost like you know banks were saying, you know, buy, buy, buy. You know, we're not even gonna check your credit. Yes. You, you could just tell us what you make. We, we're not even gonna, you know. So the industry was complicit in that. So oh, it wasn't, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. Absolutely. But I tell you, a lot of people got wealthy in that market too. Yes. So there was bad. But there was Winners good. and losers, yes. I mean, there, it was both. So you have to understand real estate to understand when to get in, when to get out, how to buy, when to buy. Um, do I need to buy? have a grant to buy? Is, is this going to affect me long term? There's just so many different avenues uh, when it comes to real estate. So that is important. How to buy, when to buy, location, location, location is important. However, I do believe greed was also there, too. People were refinancing out money, playing with the money, not doing what they were supposed to do with the money. Most people, and I like your story, you took your first house. You could have refinanced that house and did other things, but you didn't do that. You refinanced the, money, the house and you took money out. We call it leverage. And you bought four of the properties. Yes. That's a game play. Yeah. Yeah. Mo most people didn't hear that story, but I, I kind of shared it publicly. And, and I always thank uh, Dr. Stinson for his wisdom on that. He asked me when I was about to purchase my first home, uh, ask for a 15-year and a 30-year loan. 
uh, most people just assume, the banks assume, 30 years. So they start the process at 30 years, just like with a car. You go and buy a car, somebody assuming it's five years. Okay, ask for a four year. Ask for, so they always extend the life of the loan without the, the possibility of you trying to pay it off early and being locked in. So I, I went with the 15 year mortgage uh, because of my career pathway. I had done well, I eventually paid it off, and as opposed to refinancing it and, or selling it and moving out to Weston and where all of the uh, rich people live, I, I leveraged the, the resources, the equity in that house, and purchased four more investment properties, and, and they've done well over the past um, 20 plus years, and that was the catalyst for me uh, with my decision from a financial standpoint. Not being a real estate agent, but at the height, I at one point owned about 10 homes. Uh, but again, it started with a conversation with someone who gave me perspective as it relates to the options mm -hmm. that I have, which many of us don't know about the options that, that we have for some of the financial decisions that we make. If home ownership is the epicenter for uh, one's financial independence and, and pathway toward generational wealth, what do we say to our young people graduating from Miami-Dade County Public Schools, the third largest school district in the nation, and we're saying to them, go, graduate, get a job, do well, and come back. What do we say to them about the market that we're facing now here in Miami? If home ownership is the catalyst for uh, long-term wealth. So we have to start educating our consumers and our buyers. There are so many grants that are available. Um, and I want to share with you. Yeah, this talk is, about some, please, yes. I, I want to share with you um, a couple of stories when we were in that 2008, 9, and 10 market. And I want to use school professionals, specifically school teachers, that I put into homes during that period. Um, at that time, there were grants that was called the NSP Neighborhood Stabilization Program Grant, where each um, city or municipality got to apply from the federal government. They gave millions of dollars, and we started to buy blighted properties because this was the area of the real estate collapse. And for those that, that don't know, um, you would have 10 houses on one block just abandoned. It was bad. And we started to pick up those properties. We would buy them cash and we would put people who could qualify for grants, okay, your everyday professional to get into those homes. And when I say we did everything over to those houses from the roof, electrical, plumbing, you name it, we did it. They should not have had to have a repair in the next 15 years. Um, and we were able to give out 100,000 in grants for one particular buyer, 150,000 in grants. And so what that grant looked like is that we gave them 60,000, up to 60,000 for down payment and closing cost assistance. And then we gave an additional 60 to 80,000 for the repairs of the properties. Now we didn't give that money physically to you, but we had repair teams, contractors, they came in, did what they needed to do. And I could tell you to this day, those homeowners probably would not have been homeowners without those grants, even in that market. So today, moving forward, there are so many grants that are available in the Tri-County area. You're talking about West Palm Beach, Broward, Dade, and other you know, cities too, but this is where we focus, and the people just don't know. So we have to educate them. What we just did is what we need to continue to do for borrowers even coming out of high school, because there's no age limit on who can qualify, for a property in terms of grant funds. And that brings me to another segue. Um, my husband and I just bought a school building. That's a school building and a church. It's 25,000 square feet. 11 banks told us no. 11 banks told us no with good credit, great credentials, tax returns, fully documented. But now at this time, banks were filing bankruptcy. Do you remember that? And so the commercial space was afraid to give out loans. This is not an apartment building where you have tenants. This is where you have students. Yeah. Um, and it's a private school and 95% of the, 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 the students are on scholarship. And so we got the loan done through a hard money lender. We had to come up with about 40%, it was about a, a million five. But we were able to get a grant for 450,000 from the Miami Foundation CREO. So again, if we're not in the right spaces, if we're not you know, talking to the right people, coming out of our our shells and, and really just communicating. Like, I'm thankful for the relationship that we have. 
Um, and I'm sure that I met you through at a gathering or somewhere. And so we have to get out of our shell sometimes and, and go to these meetings, go to our city council meetings. That's important. You need to know what's going on. There's so many, there's so many grants that people just don't know about. You know, you, you, you speak about grants and some people may be smirched the notion of, of grants, but once again, I can say my first home, uh, I got a about grant. That. You talked about I that. I got the MAP first home buyers $3,000 grant. If I stayed in the house for five or 10 years, they forgave the $3,000. $3,000 then was a lot of money to get me started. Right. Uh, and again, that's now MD, the Miami-Dade Economic Advisory Trust that also has a, a home ownership program. With respect to the housing crisis, the housing affordability crisis, I wanna qualify that. We have a housing crisis, but we have a housing affordability crisis in Miami-Dade County and quite frankly, we South do. Florida. Um, but we're still the third largest school district. We're an A-rated school district. We have committed and caring and compassionate uh, educators that work uh, in our schools day in and day out, and not just educators, bus drivers, food service workers. Uh, what types of programs are out there right now that uh, they, should, they should be looking for? So MD is one. So that grant is now over $20,000, and it is forgivable if you live in the house for X amount of years, just you're looking but, but, but when you juxtapose that, and I'm, I'm not pushing back on the grant. Okay. Okay, 20,000 is 20,000, 40,000 would be 40,000, 50,000. I saw on social media yesterday. Okay. Yesterday, a house in Broward County found it interesting. It says $26,000 down. And in the comments, everybody was saying, well, what's the price? Right, right. And so nobody would get to the price, and everybody said, we need the price. They only showed the kitchen, the pool, and a space of the living room. I don't know what that was about. But... $26,000 down sound like a great amount of money. $40,000 down sound like a great amount of money. Yeah. But if you're talking about a seven, dollars $800,000 house or a five, dollars $600,000 house because of the market, it still precludes people from getting into it when they're teachers and, and custodians and bus drivers and food service workers that really make this community run. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we're finding, and I'm, I, I'm gonna ask you this, I want you to repeat the question. What do you say to people with respect to even the availability of grants juxtaposed with the housing affordability crisis in Miami-Dade County. Well, so we I, give you a grant, but the housing affordability, the price of homes is still exorbitant. So I wanna say this, and, and this is a small pocket, but I do wanna mention it, Dr. Gallen. So Miami-Dade County and Broward County, they do build affordable housing, and they have a price point that you cannot go over. Uh, we actually built the first two um, container homes between Miami Gardens and Opelika. You could not sell that property for over three hundred and fifty thousand. Now I'm going to tell you this: the property really was worth six hundred and six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. But because of how they acquired the property from the county, and it was an affordability property, there was a threshold. Now, while that's a small population of housing, I get it. Um, how would one person know about that? That's another question. So they got to go to the home buyer seminars. Okay. Um, they have to plug into to NARAB, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers, um, where we preach, we, we teach, we preach this stuff. But you've got to say, hey, I'm going to come. You have so many people that register that won't even show up. I got you. Because they don't believe that it's real. Okay. They don't believe that it's real. And so we have to continue to educate. We have to continue to push that narrative that there is or in our programs available for affordable housing. The other thing that I'm seeing a lot of people do is house together. They're actually rooming together. They're actually applying for loans together. And in this market, unfortunately, that's what you've got to do to make it happen. If that's so what you choose to do. Um, the no. condo market here is a little weird. Yeah. Um, so, you know. So, so, so look, looking at all of these realities that, that reflect in, in many regards some impediments. Uh, we have some continued challenges uh, for our young people who are transitioning out as we're telling them to, to come back. But, but part of the, the solution is education and exposure. And I wanna thank you and, and definitely Danny Felton for uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with me in District 1 to start this conversation with a new generation of leaders, of professionals, of uh, members of the workforce, and a future generation of homeowners. So 
we're going to continue this work. Yes. Uh, definitely want to thank you for the conversation. It, it is so, so much to it, uh, but it all starts with, with knowledge, and, which is power, which is grounded in, in real financial literacy, which we can't simply rely on the school system to do it. We all have to do it as families, as community members, as leaders, uh, and, and come together, and that's something we're doing. Um, as we prepare to close, any final thoughts you would like to, to share? I'm, I'm really excited about real estate. I know that there's a, sometimes, I know we want our kids to come back into the Miami-Dade, Broward area, but sometimes it might behoove them to move out, venture out, get more exposure, go into a more affordable market so that they can experience what some people have experienced here in the Tri-County area. And we talked about it before where, you know, a lot of people are just doing very well in real estate because of when they got started. So definitely, make sure, this is what I want to end with. Make sure you keep up your credit scores. Make sure you understand how to finance and budget and understand how to leverage real estate. You, you know, whether it's a single family home that you're going to move into, whether it's a duplex that you're going to move into, where you could live in one side and have somebody help by renting out that next side is also an option. Uh, but definitely do not take it off the table. There is wealth in real estate. And can I add a fourth? Yes. Educate yourself Absolutely. about the process, about the process, about the process. We find that the educational delta, the gap between those who know and those who don't, is what actually perpetuates and expands and amplifies yes. that disparity. So it's a disparity of knowledge. It's a disparity of information, which has a disparity on how the outcomes affect one group of people versus the other. Uh, as I prepare to close, uh, who would you like to give a shout out to? On my show, I always close out with a shout out. Give somebody a shout out. Well, you know what? I'd like to shout out Tina Howell, my mentor since I was 12, Mommy Carol City, um, and you. I, I shout you out. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to, to all of the uh, educators, all of the members of the gra graduating class of 2024. Uh, we recognize the pain, we recognize the struggle. Yes but we also recognize the power that we have to address these very difficult, challenging issues and, and remove some of these barriers to uh, not only your self-proficiency, uh, your self-sufficiency, uh, your independence, but pathways toward home ownership and a pathway toward generational wealth, which we can break the cycle. We can only break it together. So again, shout out to all of those people and shout out to you and, and Danny for standing shoulder to shoulder Thank in this you. work and we're looking forward to moving forward. This has been another episode of Real Talk with Dr. Steve Gallon III. Until next episode. I've been on the vibe kind of hard to describe. I'm in between I'm good and it's fine but I'm tired of the grind. Then I come alive in the night to realize I'm in the middle of the time of my life. I never so packed for the stack. Never lied on the back. Got a bag from the way that I write it. Queen looking Tyson. Do that I survived doing 80 to the house. Then I hit it to the sky. Change haters on a tirade. Talking to the crib in the face. Be still like that hate stuff fade. We all want the same. We all want a meal in the safe. I want to live like I'm trying to get lightning. Trail spill from my lips. Feel big from the bit. Take a sip till I pass out. Try and get grip, but it don't make sense. Cause you can lose life on this fast.